come back into the room if you've wandered away. Take a deep breath together. Let's sigh a deep breath in and out. I want to reflect with you today on the uh, sort of ultimate piece of General Assembly, the, the final highlight of that week is the where lecture, and it's where we bring somebody, typically not a Unitarian Universalist, in to the convention to uh, speak with us. It's, it's a religious service. Um, we sing hymns and, and we learn about whatever this person has to say. And this year it was Brian Stevenson. Uh, he is the author of a book called Just Mercy. Uh, and the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery. He's a defense attorney. He defends people on death row frequently. And um, if the book is anything like the lecture, um, I could highly recommend it. Anyone read the book in here yet? Just Mercy? No? Okay. Let's, let's, anyone going to the beach soon? <laughs> well, read it. Read it. You're going to the beach. Okay. You have the book assignment. Um, it's probably not a beach read, but whatever. Um, so, Brian Stevenson uh, was the Ware Lecturer, defense attorney. And um, um, so, in this just, this GA, of course, as I think you've become aware, was very much focused on um, dismantling white supremacy, thinking about uh, racism within our beings, within our congregations within our tradition and within our culture at large. Um, and Brian Stevenson is an African-American defense attorney from Alabama. Uh, paired with what I'm about to say was a common uh, refrain that was actually painted on one of the walls, also occurred in many of the workshops and many of the worship services at GA. And that was this, which you've probably heard before, this quote from Lila or Lila Watson, who is an Australian Aboriginal activist, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So that refrain is echoing throughout GA, and I feel like it echoed throughout uh, Brian Stevenson's Ware Lecture. He basically, um, laid out for us that there were four interrelated steps to fight oppression and injustice. The first step is to change the narrative. The second step is to get proximate. The third step is to be uncomfortable. And the last is to hope. Although, I, the way that I just laid it out is in steps, and they're not in steps. They're all interrelated. It's more like a weave than a, a program and one will inform the other. So change the narrative, right? And one of the most poignant things that he told us was, um, in his opinion, in his experience, the opposite of poverty isn't wealth. It's injustice. I'm sorry, it's justice. The opposite of poverty is justice. Not wealth, justice. Right there, that begins to open up a new way to think about poverty. So we're changing the narrative there. But of course, he's talking about uh, poverty, particularly as it relates to race. And that was uh, what we were thinking about as a tradition. And so uh, changing the narrative. The narrative in this country about race often is that we don't have a race problem anymore. Or if we do, there are uh, reasons for it that um, kind of insidiously bubble up in us, and we attribute it to, oh, they're, you know, uh, why don't they just do, right? So one of the reasons why that happens in this country is because, according to Stevenson, uh, the great evil of slavery wasn't involuntary servitude, although certainly that was evil but rather the narrative of racial difference. 
that was used to justify slavery. The narrative preceded the action and was in fact even uh, adopted, promoted by the U.S. Supreme Court at one point. So racial difference is the narrative that we need to change. And it's old. And it is subtle. We can't change the narrative if we bury the lead and this country has done a very good job of burying the lead. In this case, the lead is history and how we talk about it and how we don't and how much we do both of those things. All right, so Brian made the point that in South Africa, the history of apartheid is openly discussed. And in Germany, Holocaust stones are placed in front of homes where Jews were taken from and sent to camps. Because Germany's trying to change the narrative. They're looking back on their own history. But in the US, we avoid discussions of slavery and lynching. Right? And, and this was a reality in this country uh, in, in your lifetimes, many of you. Lynching was a spectator sport in this country in the lifetimes of many of the people in this room. And then today, then we just we don't even talk about that. It's not part of the discussion about why things are the way they are. So Brian is asking us to look back at our history, to find our complicity in that narrative, to bring it forward as a as a way of of We'll never be free of it, but we can at least be opened by it. So if we don't talk about it, or when, I should say when we do talk about it, uh, we do not talk about it in any but the immediate sense. So like, we'll see a, a photograph on a television show about a lynching, right? But what we don't really talk about is what it was like to live in that world where that is possible for many generations, and what that does to everybody involved. We don't talk about who was holding the rope and our relationship to them. It wasn't just six drunk racists. It was a whole culture, and in fact, a narrative. So the narrative is fundamentally important. So, there are other narratives um, that are economic in nature, right? That have to do with our history. We were in New Orleans, we got a ride from an Uber driver, and uh, he was, we just, you know, who are you, kind of conversation, chatting with him. And he had come down from Baton Rouge, and he was working as an Uber driver to save up money to uh, retire in Tennessee, and he's going to do a farm thing in Tennessee. And he had inherited and was going to sell, in order to finance this, a big bunch of property in Minnesota that he was renting out to farmers, and he was going to sell it. He got that property uh, in the in the land grab, in the land rush, which I guess I thought was just in Oklahoma, but evidently it was in more places than that. And he, you know, he, he told the story. And he was proud of it, and, I, and we've told this story. In a, in a way that's kind of proud, like, oh, our ancestors, like, we got this land, and then we said, you know, go forth and uh, be pioneer people and set up your your uh, your farm, and and you know, as long as you got there first and and can hold it for a little bit, it's yours, right? But we we don't tell the story about who was there before, yeah. who we took that land from, Thank and you. so this guy gets to sell his property in Minnesota to make a farm. He gets the wealth, the legacy of that wealth. The wealth of that legacy. Meanwhile, there's a whole other group of people in our culture who that land got taken from or who were brought here against their will, were 
eventually freed and promised some land and never was that delivered. That is a totally different inheritance, right? And they are, we think of them as not related, but they are in fact fundamentally related. And one is this great um, story of rugged individualism and sort of a patriotic uh, claim staking, right? But it, it privileged some while others were being deprived. And that is living today in our economics. This guy is going to sell the land that his great granddaddy got. And he's going to set himself up. That is not possible for some other folks, right? We have to look at that narrative of brave pioneer and understand that, yes, that person, that family, they were brave and they were industrious. And there was a lot of other stuff that goes along with it that if we don't look at, we miss an opportunity to move forward. Brian says that because we haven't talked about it, we actually haven't confronted all the myths that slavery created. There are myths that were created about people that we haven't really addressed. Myths about who's smart, who's not, who's capable, who's not. And these myths actually created conditions and social relationships and cultural norms that we haven't confronted. Okay, so now just think about that for just a little bit. I hope there's a little bit of pinch there for some of you. Because that's what you want. When you change the narrative, you automatically begin to get a little bit more proximate to the other. You automatically get a little uncomfortable because you've probably become quite comfortable in this narrative. And at some point, you have to, uh, you have to throw your rope onto hope. So that's how the that's a quick picture of the interweave of these things that you start to do one and the others are bound to come along. So the second thing was getting proximate, getting close. And Brian says you cannot advance justice until you get close enough to feel some of what you are trying to correct. Now this is a this is kind of a good news, a good news, bad news story for us. I know there are people in this room who get close. I think we can probably do better. I know I can do better. But this is actually this is really hard for me. Getting proximate is difficult for me because often I don't really like being proximate. Uh, to people. <laughs> um, anybody? <laughs> um, and even when I do, I find myself sometimes having to engage. And I don't know, I've thought about it and I don't really have a good answer. I, maybe I'm afraid of the commitment that is, I know it's going to require of me once I open my eyes and get proximate. Maybe I'm afraid of my complicity being revealed or of losing my space or losing my time. Um, I need to do better. I know on this I need to do better. But also I want to know, I kind of want to wrestle with what does it mean? to be proximate, because I think that could be easily misinterpreted. I mean, it doesn't mean to shadow some person of color like a weirdo liberal stalker, right? <coughs> I'm just going to be next to you. <laughs> uh, does this mean pulpit swaps with American Methodist Episcopalian Church, or choir swaps with black churches or Hispanic churches? Maybe, but not really. 
Does it mean intentionally setting a goal to become more diverse as a congregation, to hire diversity, to sing and read diverse songs and readings? Yes, and not entirely. Does it mean volunteering to help the oppressed out of oppression? Sure, but not fully. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. I think getting proximate means all of those things that I just mentioned to some extent, but more than that, and along with it, it means recognizing our deep interconnectedness with each other to the point that when the other hurts, we hurt. And this is a recognition. This is not something that we are actually needing to do anew. We hurt already. You might not know it yet. But when you change the narrative and when you get proximate, it will be revealed how you are suffering. My liberation is bound with yours. I don't know if you guys were here, if you remember the story I told a couple of weeks ago about when I was walking in New Orleans and had that moment where I suddenly realized I wasn't being uh, claimed by a racist impulse and how good that felt. I did not know before that how I was being hurt. But now I know, and that is the promise of proximity. Now, the good thing is, in this congregation, with our intention, you all actually compel me to get proximate. I sometimes get proximate on your behalf. And that's okay. You know, you, uh, you sent me to Standing Rock. That was getting proximate. And because of the work we do together, I went down to the Borderlands trip and got proximate. Um, now, that was good. And it actually opened me up to a new host of horrors, tragedies, complications, complicities, and possibilities. So they were profound, but at the same time, just they were just a sliver of what can be done. So, I think what getting proximate means is maybe finding the thing that they are fighting for and fight for it, knowing that you're on the wall as well. And we have opportunities for this. Keep Tucson together, our charity basket of the month. We're here last week, right? Was that last week? Two weeks ago, I am in a time work, uh, asking for volunteers. And she said it'd be great if you were a Spanish speaker, but that doesn't, that's, do, if you do not let that uh, be a roadblock to you. They need help. There's a lot of help that can be had out there. So getting proximate, knowing that that work will be part of your own liberation. I can't describe to you what that's going to be, or, but I think I can tell you how it's going to feel. It's going to feel like a lot of things, and at the end of the day, it's going to feel good. But doing that, you will, of course, uh, feel your own brokenness first. So when you go down this week, tomorrow, and when you pick up the phone and call Keep Tucson Together, I want you to do so with written on your arm in Sharpie. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. That should be on your arm. I'll let you give you a few minutes to write that on your arm. We'll listen to some music.
only comfortable and convenient. Brian Stevenson said that. He says, we will not create justice until we are willing to sometimes position ourselves in uncomfortable places and be a witness. And if you get proximate and change the narrative, that's going to happen. I had lunch earlier this week with my good friend and colleague, uh, Reverend Andy Burnett up in Chandler. Um, he told me, I was talking about it. How do we get, what is proximate? How do we get proximate? How do you get proximate? And he said, well, I've over years established a relationship with uh, local black church leaders. And uh, in fact, he, and he said, it's hard. It's really hard work. And I'm constantly like em embarrassing myself. And um, it's difficult sometimes. And the story that he told was he was asked to come to a prayer breakfast. Uh, some of his congregants and him to come to a prayer breakfast uh, at that church. And they did. They had a great time. They ate breakfast. It was fine. And then at the end, there was a moment of prayer in a way that uh, they don't pray in that church like we pray in our church. It was more of an altar call kind of thing. Um, a real come to Jesus kind of highly energized prayer. Andy was fine with that because Andy grew up in a very conservative Pentecostal tradition, so he was kind of used to that. He had no problem doing it, but um, he also felt uncomfortable because he was doing that in front of, you know, you all. And he could tell that his people felt uncomfortable. So that was just like one very small example of the difference, differences uh, that will result in our being uncomfortable. And that's not even like an ethical dilemma. That's just a cultural difference. There are, there are ethical issues and histories that are going to make us real uncomfortable. The church in Baton Rouge uh, has done amazing things. They actually, their church site is on the site of a, a former plantation. Now, you know, um, I don't know what that means exactly. It could have been a giant spread of land that has been over the years subdivided, but nonetheless, the land that they are on is land that was was a plantation at one time. And so they've done the work of going back in their history to, to collect the names and to bring forth the names of the people who lived and died on that land. They have done the work to know whose legacy they are in and to understand that the narrative is bigger than just a mortgage. So if you do get proximate and if you change the narrative, you will feel uncomfortable. You'll feel, hopefully you'll feel the pain of oppression. And hopefully you will feel some culpability with it. And some guilt. And hopefully you will feel rage. And you will probably feel shame. That's what, that's what justice work looks like and feels like. I mean, that's part of it. It's not the whole of it. But if we want to make the change, if we want to understand that our liberation is bound up with other people's, that is some of the things that we will move through. You might even be shamed. You might deserve it. And you might not. And you will make mistakes. If you get close to inequality, you'll get cut. That's Stevenson again. If you get close to just injustice, you'll get bruised. If you get close to things that are painful and difficult and unequal, it will hurt you. It will make you uncomfortable. But in discomfort, he assures us, there is a power. In brokenness, we understand something about compassion. In our own brokenness, we begin to understand something about compassion. It's the broken who understand the way justice really needs to work. It's the broken who understand why we need mercy. It's the broken who can show us how we make our commitment to justice actionable. 
So here's the thing of it. We are already broken. This is the mythic lesson of original sin, which we sort of do away with. But inherent worth and dignity, which we affirm, does not mean inherently free of blemish or always being right. We have inherent dignity because we have inherent error. And we rise to meet it with grace and compassion. And we are open and grateful to that brokenness. Changing the narrative will get you proximate, will get you hurt. But we're already hurting. Personally, interpersonally, as a culture, as a country. Let us transform that pain into recognition, and from that recognition, into connection, into compassion. And when it gets painful, as it will, that's when we anchor ourselves to hope. That's when we keep our eyes on the prize. Not necessarily on what is happening immediately where we are. Sometimes it gets so painful we need to think about what we are working for in the long term. So keep hope close and develop the ability to hold your complicity and your self-forgiveness in tension. Hope is the tonic for that. Hope will lead us through the struggle as we continually understand that if we are here to help another, we are wasting our time, but if we have come to help because our liberation is bound up with the others, with yours, with mine, then we can work for a more just world.